decided to join us today. I actually don't know where Madeline is, but I have two napping kids and they're not going to stay asleep for long. So we are going to get started without her this morning. If you were with us last week, then you know that we started a brand new series talking about the different names of God. Does anyone remember the first name of God we talked about last week? Hmm. Yeah, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Now, this week, I want to get started with a game. You're going to see two different pictures appear on the screen. Your job... <laughs> oh my gosh. Madeline, I had no idea you were there. Julia, I'm always there. <laughs> Kidding, I just got here early. I wanted to have a little bit of fun with oh. you. <laughs> does relate to this week's new name of God that we're going to be talking about, what? but I was just telling the Kids Questers about a game that we're going to start with. Amazing! Mm -hmm. This game involves two pictures showing up on the screen at the same time. 
The kids questers are going to see how many differences they can spot between the pictures in two minutes, okay? So count up how many differences you can see and we'll see if you're right when we get back. Good luck! <laughs> is Jehovah Shammah, which means God is everywhere. Just like Madeline hiding on me and you at the beginning, or trying to spot the differences between those two pictures, even though it was hard to notice sometimes, sometimes we don't notice, we can't, just like in that way, we can't always see God, but we know that he's always, always with us. You know what? This reminds me of a great book that I've read recently. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's right here. Is God always with me? Oh, I love this. What a great question. Would you like to hear a kid's questers? Is God always with me wherever I go? Is he with me each minute? I'd sure like to know. Can God always hear me wherever I pray? Can I talk to God any time of the day? Mm. If Caitlin's afraid when the thunder goes boom, is God close beside her? right there in her room. Zoe looks sad when her friend says goodbye. What will God do if they both start to cry? What if I'm bad and I do not obey? Will God be upset? Will he go far away? When it's my birthday, is God there to see the big birthday cake that was made just for me? The Bible tells us as plain as can be that God is with you and God is with me. At school or at home, in a bus or a car, God's always with you wherever you are. Before you were born, God was waiting for you. And now that you're here, God is here with you too. God knows when you eat and he watches you play. He sees when you sleep at the end of the day. Whenever you need him, God will be there. He's happy to listen to every prayer. You can pray any time of the day or the night. At home or away, any place is just right. God is with Caitlin and he is with you through thunder and rain and quiet times too. So don't be afraid because you're never alone. God is right there in your very own home. Zoe is sad that her friend went away, but God's with them both wherever they stay. God cares about you if you're sad or upset. He sends you his love. It's the best you can get. If your friend's sick in bed, God will be there. Just pray for your friend. God will answer your prayer. Riding a bike or tying your shoe, sometimes these things can be hard to do. 
but God's here to help you. So maybe he'll send a parent who cares or a neighbor or friend. Tell God your story when you have been bad. Then God will forgive you and you will be glad. God's there on your birthday and all through the year, each day of the week, God will always be near. He helps you to learn and he helps you to grow. He shows you the way that he wants you to go. God says that he's with you each day and each night and you can believe him because God's always right. You know God is with you, so put on a smile. He'll be with you forever and that's a long while. Wow, Madeline, thank you for reading that book. I love it. How about you, Kids Questers? Did you love that too? And did you catch that it talked about how God is always with us and we can always talk to him because he's always right there. But you might be wondering, Julia, Madeline, how do we know that's true? It's a nice idea, but why should we believe that it's really true? And it kind of mentioned it in this book. It's because we can believe that that's true because it says so in the Bible many, many times. But one of our favorites is Psalm 139, 7 to 12. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to read the message version of that, okay? This is what it says. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight, God? If I climb up to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you, God. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. This is great news for us, isn't it? Who has ever felt scared? Who's ever felt lonely? Who's ever felt defeated? Mm. Who's ever felt uncertain? Jehovah Shema. The God of the universe, the God who made you and me, says that there is nowhere we can go that God isn't with us. Mm. You are never alone. Wow, that is great news, Madeline. You know what? Let's not take that for granted this week. Let's not forget when we're feeling lonely. Maybe you're going to feel lonely at school this week. Maybe you're going to feel uncertain about a decision you have to make. Mm. Maybe uh, you're going to feel scared. Maybe it's going to be something like Caitlin in this book, like a thunderstorm. Or maybe it's going to be something completely different. Call out to Jehovah Shema. Call out to God and ask him to give you the peace or the joy or the comfort or the wisdom that he promises to give those mm. who put their trust in him. That's your challenge this week. And uh, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week. Hopefully Madeline will be on time. <laughs> for our next name of God. Have a great week, Kids Questers. See ya. How great is our God. In Psalm 104, verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. And in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 31, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The splendor of the King clothed in majesty Time is in his hands Begin 
sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me how great. pleasure to greet you again this morning and to share from the Word. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, we have a guest speaker, Major Steve Wiseman from THQ. So please join in again next week uh, to listen to what God will say through Major Steve's sermon. I want to share with you this morning from Matthew, uh, John chapter 21 and continue this theme, uh, this invitation of Jesus to come. Two Sunday mornings ago, come to me, all you who are thirsty, people who are empty, people with a yearning for more, people who have a real thirsting after God. You come, Jesus said. You come, and I'll give you water that satisfies. Then last Sunday morning, the invitation, come, all you who are just overwhelmed with life, burdened, you're tired, you're frustrated, you're carrying the weight of the world around. Come to me. And rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This morning the invitation is to come and dine as recorded in John's Gospel chapter 21. I'm going to read some verses to you. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase so you might just want to listen. Early in the morning, the beginning of a new day, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Their response, no. He said, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you will have some. And they did. 153 large fish filled the nets, didn't break them. Now the work would begin getting them to shore. But then John looks a little closer. John, the beloved disciple, the scriptures say, and he sees it's Jesus and he says to Peter, it's Jesus, it's the Lord. Peter, in his excitement, as Peter would, jumped out of the boat and ran to the shoreline as the rest of the disciples dragged the nets ashore. When they got landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the day's catch. And they did. And Jesus said to them, now come and eat breakfast. Come and dine. Come and dine. You see, the disciples had been out all night in a fishing boat. Um, no doubt they were sweaty and tired. Uh, their hair was probably a mess, their beards and all of that. Maybe even a stench of fish. Maybe they did catch some and threw them back. But they weren't doing very well. Peter was dripping wet from jumping into the water. So they were quite a motley crew. They weren't the best dressed. They weren't the best smelling. They weren't the best looking. But Jesus still invites them to come. Come and dine. Come a little bit closer. Come as you are. Isn't that a beautiful invitation? To come as you are. And in that invitation, we can hear the echo of all the great invitations of God as we find it in Scripture. God is always inviting us into fellowship, into a deeper love, into a more meaningful communion with Him. 
God enjoys when his children come closer. And God's invitation is always gracious and open. Always, with no strings attached. With God, it's always come as you are. Come as you are. In John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 35, and a part of verse 37, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And anyone who comes to me, I will never turn away. Think about that. I will never turn away. Always an open invitation. Always. I mean, in, look at in the Gospels, uh, Zacchaeus, tax collector. He was uh, probably dishonest, uh, greedy, certainly hated by those in the community. Wanted to see Jesus. He had heard about him. He climbs into a tree and Jesus is walking along and he looks up. He sees Zacchaeus. He says, come down. Come. I'm going to your house for fellowship. Others around said, who is this guy? He's eating with sinners. It was disgusting. No strings attached with the invitation. Come as you are. Come as you are. Anyone who comes to me, I will never turn away. That's wonderful news this morning for all of us. That's wonderful news for some who may be watching here this morning. And you wonder if you could ever be allowed into the presence of a holy God. Well, hang in there. There's more he wants to say this morning. Now, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. When he gives that invitation and when we suggest that he's saying to you, come as you are. He's also saying, don't stay as you are. Don't stay as you are. Come as you are. Doesn't mean that Jesus was a moral wimp condoning sin because he happened to love sinners. Of course not. It's just that Jesus knew that love and acceptance is a more powerful change agent than shame, insults, condemnation, and fear. Jesus never said, and I repeat, stay as you are to anyone. But he did say over and over in so many words, come as you are. Come as you are. There's room in the kingdom of God for all. When he died on the cross, we were all equal at the foot of the cross. Come as you are. The songwriter, I don't fully remember the name, but anyway, let me give you the words. Come as you are. That's how I want you. Come as you are. Feel right at home, close to the heart, loved and forgiven. Come as you are. Why stand alone? No need to fear. Love sets no limits. No need to fear. Love never ends. Don't run away shamed and disheartened. Rest in my love. Trust me again. I come to call sinners, not just the virtuous. I come to bring peace, not to condemn. Each time you fail to live by my promise, why do you think I'd love you the less? Come as you are. That's how I love you. Come as you are. Trust me again. Nothing can change the love that I have for you. All will be well. Just come as you are. Jesus calls out. Come and die. Come a little bit closer. During this time of deep disappointment and discouragement. These feelings of failures not yet dealt with. Pull back spiritually with feelings of personal failure. Turning away and going back to the old ways of life. Stumbling along each day. Struggling. And Jesus comes, beautiful voice, beautiful sound, beautiful words. I can hear his voice, calls me, come closer, come and dine, hear him. It's a voice of the second chance, really. 
It's not every day that you will find somebody who will give you a second chance. But in Jesus, Peter is living evidence. The gospel is often referred to as the gospel of the second chance because no matter how jaded our past has been, no matter how messy it's been, there's always that forgiveness that's offered in Jesus Christ who stands not only ready to forgive, but to restore. Come. Come as you are. That's his message. So there might be some today who are listening and you're saying, I really need a fresh start. I really need to see Jesus at the beginning of the day. A new day is dawning. A second chance. And even more. Past regrets, you know, something in your past that you've done or something maybe that you should have done. You can't retrace your steps. You can't go back. The mistakes have been made. But if I could only get beyond this, if I could only get beyond this, well, the man who jumped out of the boat to rush to Jesus, this would have been his experience, Peter. Peter. And you can imagine as they were sitting at this breakfast around this fire, there's a sidebar conversation that's taking place because this was the dawning of a new day for Peter. Because if you were to read further in chapter 21, even while this is going on, it says when they had finished eating, Jesus turns to Peter. And this is how the conversation went. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you, Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Ah, yea, Lord, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. The third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt, the scriptures say, because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me, Lord? You know all things. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. You see, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Three times. Even denied knowing him. But here it was Jesus, almost each time counteracting every denial, three times saying, do you really, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Because you see, Jesus was counting on Peter. Peter, upon you, I will build my church, this rock. So Peter was key for the future of the church. And then Jesus says to him, Peter, follow me. But all of the denials and all of the failings of Peter, of all people, he was God's elect one, chosen one, I should say. So when I read that, I begin to realize that in this invitation of coming, come as you are. So for Peter, with all of his denials and all of his failures, his shortcomings, his temper, his impulse, is impulsiveness the brokenness comes you are gives me hope and there's hope for you if there's someone here and you say I've turned my back upon God and everything that is good I don't feel I deserve to be in his presence I've denied him I've betrayed him I've cursed him pushed him out of my life. I don't deserve, and I'm sure God cannot love me back into his kingdom, but the invitation is, come as you are, with all of your brokenness and your failures. It's the beginning of a new day. It's the beginning of a new day. Now, there are options here. You know, we can dwell on that forever, but as they say, you can't unscramble scrambled eggs. <laughs> so we're stuck with our past, Regrets, but we don't need to live there. So there, let me suggest three options here. One option is to simply ignore what's happened in our lives. To either repress it 
or pretend it didn't happen, or worse, try to reason that it was appropriate response and that it was somebody else's fault. In some cases it would be, but even if we own, even if we should be owning it, we can just say, okay, denial. Uh, you know, it was it was wrong in the first place, but it's really not that serious. And we live our lives like that. Second option is to handle our past regrets is to go the opposite end of the spectrum, and that is to constantly beat ourselves up over it and not able to get beyond. We make ourselves a victim to ourselves. To constantly remind ourselves of our past and put ourselves down day after day after day. Like a video recording, we replay, replay every event in our lives and are unable to get beyond it. There's a song that you've probably heard on the radio many times. There's always something there to remind me. There's always something there to remind me. And these feelings of guilt that are so overwhelming. And they hold on to us so tightly that we're not able to get beyond it. Or the third option, which is the best option. And that is to bring all of our past and all of our failures and all of our regrets and all of our guilt and to bring them to Jesus when he gives that invitation to come. Just as you are, come a little closer. Let's dine together in that intimate moment of dining where we become family. Come and find forgiveness and this tender embrace total acceptance no one he will turn away no one he will turn away it doesn't matter about your past when you bring it to him he will forgive you and it will become a new day the dawning of a new day when we confess our sin to god someone said it's like being a first grader standing before a teacher with a messy paper i've covered outside the lines but the teacher says you can start over here's a clean sheet David wrote in Psalm 32, happy is the person whose sin is forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. Yes, it's true that God sets certain boundaries. Laws that are there to protect us, but when we go outside of these boundaries and when it becomes sinful in our eyes, maybe in the eyes of God, but when we confess these, we are saying that I want to start over. Dawning of a new day. And coming as I am. Jesus says, here's a new sheet. Start coloring again. Start again. You remember the prodigal son. He comes back to his father after coming to his senses. And he had fallen pretty low. As a matter of fact, slept and eat with the pigs. Almost the same menu. But he comes back to his father. Nowhere else to turn. He says, Father, I've sinned against you. The father didn't respond with, well, you know, that was your decision. It was a bad decision. I tried to talk you out of it. Didn't get into that at all. Didn't even say, it was okay, not to worry, it's done with. This is what he said. Come and dine. We're going to kill a fatted calf and have a great celebration. Let's have a party. All is forgiven. All is forgotten in the eyes of God. Beautiful invitation, isn't it? Come to him. There's a social services center in the Ontario Division where there is a bench, a mercy seat, we would call it a place of prayer, that is made out of old boards. And a craftsman got at it and made it a beautiful piece of work. And I remember visiting that center and saying, asking really, the executive director, tell me the story behind this. She went on to say that um, the wood that they had gathered came from the old burns that were torn down outside of the city. And they were selling it as reclaimed wood. So they bought some of this reclaimed wood. They built this altar as a symbol that when people kneel there in their brokenness, in their weariness, they're yearning for God with their lives messed up for some of them. 
that they could reclaim that which the enemy had stolen from them. And God was reclaiming them from the enemy that had stolen their lives. It became a place of reclaiming and new beginnings, beginning of a new day. I pray today that if you're listening and you find yourself in a situation where you're wondering, would God ever accept me again? Or can I come to him with all the mess of my life? Or do I need to try to clean it up before I come? The invitation is come and dine. Come as you are. And the scriptures say no one will be turned away. It's the whosoever gospel. It's a gospel of second, third, and fourth chances. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share this morning. Thank you for the invitation to all of us to come closer to you, to find new life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as we continue to worship together.